Uh, my name is Bob Stewart. I serve as the youth pastor here. Before we get started with the service, I want to let you know that we're going to be doing offering a little bit different, or actually going back to how it used to be at the end of service today. So they're going to be passing the plates at the end of service, just so you're ready. But if you could go ahead and stand with us as we worship this morning. to be with you guys in his freedom in his liberty of the spirit of God we are chosen we are chosen generation rise up holy nation God we live for you you have called us out of so glorious, God, we live for you. We live for you. Yes, we do, Lord. God, we live for you. We 
song we sang this morning was taken out of 1 Peter chapter 2 verses 9 and 10. But you are a chosen people, a royal priesthood, a holy nation, God's special possession, that you may declare the praises of him who has called you out of darkness into his wonderful light. Once you were not a people, But now you are the people of God. Once you had not received mercy, but now you have received mercy. Isn't God good? Let's give him praise again. Thank you, Lord. This is just a classic hymn. As we show forth his praise today. This is draw near to our God.
Thank you, Lord. We love you, Jesus. We say you are the unstoppable God. Whatever this world brings, whatever we face, you cannot be stopped. And we love you. We praise you for that, God. We are just in awe of who you are today, Jesus. And we ask right now, anyone facing an impossible situation in their life, we pray that you will do a miracle for them. If you need a miracle in your life, just reach out to the Lord this morning. Maybe it's your life. Maybe it's someone you know. But just lift a hand saying, God, I am reaching out for you to be unstoppable in this situation. And so, Lord Jesus, whether they're at home or whether they're here, we pray that you will show up through the power of your spirit, that you will do a miracle of healing, a miracle of provision, a miracle of restoration of broken relationships, a miracle of hope, a miracle of salvation by the blood of Jesus Christ. We love you, Lord. 
And we thank you that you are king above all kings, Lord of all lords. We love you, Lord Jesus. And Father, we take some time right now to bind our faith together and lift up the nation that you have placed us in. As we celebrate Independence Day, we do declare our dependence on you, Lord Jesus. Is there any freedom outside of the name of Jesus? No, not true freedom. Your word tells us it is for freedom that we have been set free in Christ Jesus. So don't let yourself then be taken back into slavery or bondage by sin or anything else. So, Lord, we pray for our nation. We pray that you will heal us, that you will save us, that you will convict us of our sin, that you will unify us, Lord, even with all the diverse mindsets, we pray that under the name of Jesus, you would rescue us, Lord. We thank you for the freedom we have in this season. We know it may not last forever, but we thank you that we can gather, we can worship the name of Jesus, we can share our faith, we can publicly proclaim that Jesus is the King, that you are our God. We love you, Lord. We just come right now and lay everything down at your feet. Any of our little idols in our life, any of our big idols that have tried to crowd you out, we lay them down at your feet. Set us free from those things, Lord. Set us free in Jesus' name. Thank you, Lord. Amen. Amen. You can be seated this morning. God is so good. He's doing something special today. You've probably already sensed it, but I just want to encourage you, even in our pre-service prayer time, God shared a word with us that he was going to do something different today, something special in our hearts. So just keep your hearts open to whatever God wants to do. We're open to that. Uh, Thank you, worship team. Uh, What an awesome crew that's leading us. Thank you. I love the diversity of styles, too. I love the lounge version. That was great. A little bossa nova beat with a flute going. I'm like, this is great. I haven't heard this style for a while, and it was awesome. And then just the power of, of worship as well. God does things in worship. We don't just do it to get us ready to hear the preaching. We start with worship because that's where God does some of his deepest work in our hearts. And when we lift him up in song, it does things. It changes the realities of our lives. So never just think worship is just, just to soften us up. It's the real thing. It's where work gets done for the glory of God. Uh, Well, hello, everybody. That was a long introduction to say hi. I'm Nathan. I'm the lead pastor here at Highland, and this is my wife, Christy, and uh, we are just happy to be here. Happy 4th of July to you all. Um, we, it's rare that it falls on a Sunday, and I could do the math right now, but I'm not going to. So uh, some of you know it happens every six years. No, every seven years. No, I don't know. Every so often. Happy 4th of July on a Sunday. Um, if you're new around here and you're getting to know us, we are so glad you're checking us out, considering maybe Highland could be where you find your church family. Um, We just want you to know you are welcome. However you are, you are welcome just as you are to be with us here. And we'd love to get to know you a little bit as you're spending time around here or watching us online. Um, And we have connection cards that you can do that with. Uh, They're in your pews or uh, online. They're in the description there for you. And I know I just stole your your first announcement. So, but with those connection cards, today we are passing the offering in in service, so just drop that in the offering bucket as it comes by offering basket. Um, Otherwise, online, you can just click submit, and then we'll get that info from you. Any prayer requests, praises, all that stuff, let us know. Today, I was thinking about when I went to Moldova, Eastern Europe in 2009. How many of you remember when I went and learned about human trafficking Pretty awesome trip. And I was able to drive with uh, missionaries Troy and Heidi Darren in their brand new Speed the Light SUV on the rockiest roads and wave at babushkas. 
I want you to keep that in mind next Sunday when you show up early and buy your donuts and coffee because that is what the funds go to, speed the light for missionaries around the world who need vehicles or AV equipment or tools to preach the gospel. I sometimes forget that missionaries are real people just like us, but Pastor Troy, I call him Pastor Troy because he was my youth pastor, he was so excited about getting his new Speed the Light vehicle. Can you imagine getting a vehicle? It's pretty amazing. So us as church people way back around here, we can help people all over the world just by buying donuts and coffee. And if you're on a diet, I applaud you. And I say put that $3 in there anyway because you can change the world, I'm telling you. Next, um, or actually... I don't think that's the right date because it says June 25th, and yeah, we already, already experienced yeah, that. July 25th. July 25th I it, it up last week that's okay. Yeah. We're, we're, human. we're human. Real God, real love, real people. Okay. <laughs> the baptism and picnic for our church this summer, summer is July 25th. It's a Sunday. And you'll have time to come to church and then go home and grab lawn chairs, swimming suits if you're getting baptized, or even if you just want to play with your kids at the beach, uh, lunch to just enjoy the afternoon together. It is so fun to get out there with our church family and just have casual conversations and just experience life together. And honestly, there's no more beautiful place in Wisconsin than Spencer Lake. So get that on your calendar today. If you're watching online, Come back to me, July 25th. You have to come out to Spencer Lake for our church picnic. We're looking forward to it, and I can't wait to hang out with all of you. Yeah, it's going to be great. And if you want to be baptized that day, you can just show up with a change of clothes and a towel. But I would love to connect with you beforehand to just help you understand what baptism is. Maybe you've been waiting to get baptized. There's no reason to wait. If you know Jesus as your Lord and your Savior, now is the time, and this is going to be a wonderful time of celebration um, for baptism. So we'd love for you to be a part of that. Uh, next Sunday, we have a special speaker from Milwaukee that will be coming up, Art Cerna Jr. He's the new director of City on a Hill, which is an inner city mission that we've gone on trips to. We support monthly. They reach out to inner city Milwaukee and have just seen a transformation of the neighborhood they're in for the glory of God. So Art is going to come next week. He's going to bring a wonderful message, let you know some of the things that City on a Hill is doing, and as we support them, we are a part of touching inner city Milwaukee, way up here in central Wisconsin. So just a great partnership we have in ministry. And I encourage you to come with an open heart next Sunday. I am so excited he has a chance to share with our congregation and for you to get to know him. Uh, with that being said, let's just get our hearts ready for God's word this morning. <laughs> So how many of you have ever known someone and then found something out about them after a while that shocked you? Like, I never knew that about you. I never knew that was a part of your life experience or that you were into collecting peanut shells and, you know, shining them up. And uh, this is bizarre. Thank you very much. Well, uh, that happened to me with my grandpa. My grandfather was the pastor of this church for 25 years in the 40s, 50s, and 60s. He died before I was born, so he was almost legendary in my mind. And uh, I think we have a picture of him here, a nice old picture from a, uh, it wasn't called Highland Church then, but from a, uh, a church picnic. There he is. Yep. I think that's down at Iverson. There's my grandma sitting by him. His name was Marshall Schrader. And uh, tall, my dad said he was a, a jokester and, and loved kids, and, uh, but was also imposing. He was a tall guy, and just if he looked at you, you knew you were in trouble. At least that's what my dad tells me. And so he, um, he pastored here for 25 years, moved the church building, built, uh, had an impact in our community for Christ. And so that's who I thought of this holy man, Marshall Schrader. 
until I got a little older and my dad started telling me stories about grandpa before he knew Jesus. Um, at the age of 14, he hopped a train. He became a hobo. I don't know if that's still an appropriate term. But that's what it was, and a lot of guys back then were hopping trains going out west. So 14, he left home, moved to Montana to work on a ranch. And as he was on that train, uh, he had found a place under a piece of machinery that was draped with something, and uh, a guy started robbing the train. I know, my grandpa was not from the 1850s, but it sounds like he was. And so he's laying there as a 14-year-old kid and watches the boots of the guy with the revolver walk right next to him. And everyone else on that car got robbed except him as he stayed under there. Once he got out to Montana, he lit a lake on fire. Um, he found an old mining place, and there was water from what had been pumped out of the mine and a bunch of kerosene but barrels, and he dumped them into the lake and lit them on fire just for fun. When he got back to the ranch, uh, the owner was like, hey, did you see all that smoke going up over there? He's like, yeah, maybe they're starting that mine back up. I don't think the guy went for it. He, after that, he became, he came back to the Midwest here, and he became a lumberjack in the UP. He had a, uh, a big sled run over his ankle and flatten it to about this thin. Gangrene set in, and his mom, who was a praying person, a born-again Pentecostal woman, called the church to a prayer meeting because they were going to have to amputate his leg. They prayed, and at this point, he didn't love Jesus. He didn't love the church. He wanted nothing to do with the Lord. They prayed for his leg, and God stopped the gangrene, restored his leg. He always walked with a bit of a limp, but he was supposed to have no leg whatsoever, and God healed him. Through that and a few other miracles, he eventually softened his heart, gave his heart to the Lord, and was called to full-time ministry. And he always said, I lived two lives. I lived two lives. I lived my life of sin before Jesus, and then the grace of God redeemed me and actually used me for something. And then he died quite young in his 60s from cancer. Um, but to the very last day, he was serving Jesus with all he had. And each one of us has more to our story than you know. It's true. Every person you've ever met has more to their story than you understand. And that should cause us to be people of interest. Ask people their stories. Ask them who they are. But it should also cause us to be people of grace. That when we see another image bearer, one created in the image of God, that we would be people that say, you're acting that way because of something I don't know about. For my grandpa, it was a limp. And he didn't tell that story all the time. But for others, we have a limp in our spirit we have a limp in our mindset. We have a limp in our language. We have something in us because of a wound or an experience in the past. And Jesus calls us, as we talked about last week, to honor one another, to treat others better than ourselves because each one of us is carrying a story that nobody knows fully except for Jesus. And today, we're going to look at Jesus. You may know Jesus. You may know that Jesus was born of the Virgin Mary, that we celebrate his birthday on December 25th, that we celebrate his death and resurrection at Easter. You may know the story of Jesus. You may know him personally. You may know that he forgives your sins, that he loves you when you didn't deserve to be loved, that he called you and chose you before the foundation of the earth world. You know, may know that. But one thing I found with Jesus, every day I learn more about him. Every day there's a part of his story that amazes me, that opens my eyes, that makes me go, there is more to you than I get. And the thing is, everything I learn is not what his life looked like as a rough and tumble teen, but that he's the creator, he's the king, He's the servant. He's the lover of our souls. He lives forever, yet he died for us. And all that that means for our lives. So today we are going to look at the life of Jesus and realize that Jesus is our example, our Savior, and our King. Jesus is our example, our Savior, and our King. If you have a Bible, open up to Philippians 2. 
5. We're going to be reading totally 5 through 7, or through 11, but we'll just start with the first little bit here. Last week, some of you uh, Bible scholars caught me on a mistake I made. I was telling you how important it was to know your Bible and to know that Corinthians comes after Philippians. No, it doesn't. Colossians was the book I meant to say. So there's my, uh, 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 we're, we're just doing real good on our humanity today, our real people not being perfect, but had to own up to that one. Let's pray, and then we'll read the word of the Lord. Heavenly Father, as we come to know your Son better today, we ask that through the power of the Holy Spirit, you will open our hearts up, that you will reveal Christ to us. Even if we think we know so much, and it's like, oh, yeah, here we go. I already know all this. Lord, there is so much more of who you are than we can even begin to comprehend. And so we pray for divine revelation. And let it change the way we live our lives. Thank you, Jesus. Amen. Philippians 2, 5 through 6a says this. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature God. So before we get into our points today, I just have to stop right there, that Jesus is our example, and Jesus is in the very nature of God. This is one of those brain breakers where you're, you get kind of a handle on it, and then it slips out, and then another, and it's like grabbing a fish, you know? It, they just can slip out so easily. Ever see those uh, YouTube videos of guys hold, holding up their fish so proud, then it flaps and it's out the boat? They're like diving after it to get it back. This concept is kind of like that. You can get it for a little while, but it's so much bigger than what our minds can hold It's difficult, and that's the concept of the Trinity, the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. These three individual pieces that make up a perfectly unified being, God. And I have wrestled with this. I have prayed about this. I have studied. I have read books. I have written about this. It is something that is this beautiful mystery that the more I think about it, the more amazed I am that God is one. We don't worship three gods, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. We worship one God made up of three distinct parts that are perfectly unified. They speak to themselves, they speak to each other, but they are also fully of one heart and one mind. And Jesus is the very nature, or another word for that is form of God. And the more that I understand the role that Jesus plays in his godhood, the more I realize he is the greatest servant of all. And that's our first point, is that Jesus is our servant. He's the humble servant. Jesus did not show up on the scene when he was born on Christmas Day. Jesus has always existed, as God has always existed. God didn't have a new part of him pop into existence. And because we call Jesus the Son of God, It's easy for us to think like, well, there was God the Father, and we always know a father comes before a son, unless you know that crazy old cowboy song, I'm my own grandpa. This is not one of those situations. You are all sons or daughters of some father, but Jesus, God the Father, God the Spirit, are eternally unified and have always existed. This idea of sonship is in his servanthood, that he serves as a son would serve a father in a healthy, perfect relationship. He trusts the father's will. He's about accomplishing the father's will. Jesus, first act that we see him doing is part of creation. God the Father spoke the universe into existence. In Genesis 1 and Genesis 2, you'll read about God creating the universe. And however you see that he did that, there are so many different reasonable theological ways to view that passage of Scripture. One thing is true in all of them, in all healthy viewpoints, is that God spoke the universe into existence. 
And the Bible tells us Jesus is the living word of God. So that word that went forth was Jesus, the vibrations of the voice of God, that external expiration of his presence is Christ. He is the living word that created all things, that is in all things, and the word of scripture that is alive. Are your brains starting to break a little bit? Yeah, that's good. If you could grasp all this, then how big of a God do we really serve? So Jesus, eternally present in the past, serving God the Father, the spoken word of God, the living word that we all exist by, is Jesus. So in my book, he should be in charge. He should be the king. He should show up on earth, and everyone will fall down and bow to him. But the first time he shows up physically is in the womb of a young single woman. Not much more humble opportunity in that day and age than to be born into a very religious community to a single woman. That's not a place of honor. In that culture, in that time, that is a, she had to leave home for a while. She had to go live with her cousin. Mary had to go live with Elizabeth to hide the shame of the pregnancy. Now, in reality, there was no shame. In reality, there was no sin committed. In reality, it was the presence of God overshadowing this young woman, and she even responds, Mary responds, who am I? Who am I that you would give me this honor? She saw the honor of it, but nobody else did. In fact, her soon-to-be husband needed an angelic visitor to show up and convince him that his wife hadn't cheated on him, or wife-to-be, and say, this is God's moving. This is God's hand at work. So even before Jesus was born of Mary, he was in a humble, lowly state. And then I won't preach through all the details of it, but, but many of you know the story of Christmas that he was born in a manger because there's no room for him, that he was attended to by shepherds, not kings and queens. He came into the world the opposite of how I would write the script. But God wanted us to know he was here to serve us. Let's read the next passage in Philippians 2, 6b through 11. I'll just back up to the beginning of 6. Who being in the very nature of, God did not consider equality with God something to be used for his own advantage. Rather, he made himself nothing. That's what we see right there at that point of of being carried by Mary in his birth. He made himself nothing by taking the very nature of a servant. That same word nature is the same word nature. The very nature, the very form of God, the very nature, the very form of a servant. So as much as he identifies as God, he identifies as a servant. Being made in human likeness and being found in appearance as a man, he humbled himself by becoming obedient to death, even death on the cross. What an incredible, incredible thing that the creator of the universe would package himself in this tiny little being and allow himself to be wrapped in flesh. How many of you have had your bodies hurt in the last 24 hours? Aches, pains, or how many of you don't have your bodies quite work the way you wish they did? I mean, yeah, yeah, I think that goes for just about all of us. How about last question? How many of you don't look the way you wish you looked? Okay, there we go. The Bible says Jesus wasn't even attractive. We see all these beautiful pictures of medieval artists and Renaissance artists and these amazing carvings that just make Jesus look so impressive. The Bible says he was homely. There was nothing about his physical appearance that would attract anyone to him. I mean, I've always heard there's someone for everybody, right? No matter what you look like, there's someone that's going to like you, not Jesus. There was nothing about his appearance that would draw anybody to him. 
He didn't have the right look for Instagram or TikTok. No filter was going to fix that. In fact, when he was being beaten at the cross, the Bible says he didn't even look human. He was so disfigured. Can you imagine the body Jesus could have chosen to be born into? How impressive he could have made his own body. How amazing and and, yeah, I mean, you watch the Passion of the Christ, you're like, oh, yeah, I would follow that guy. He looks pretty good. But he probably had a bit of a patchy beard. Maybe he had a bald spot. We don't know. Nothing wrong with those things, but that's not what that day and age valued. The Jewish people valued thick beards and long hair. Hair on the sides of their head that would grow long. So, Jesus born of a virgin, a servant. So first we see Jesus surrenders here. He willfully gives up his rights. He willfully gives up his appearance. He willfully gives up his position. That is not something that's very popular for us today, is it? Man, Lord, thank you that you would give up, that you would sacrifice not just your life on the cross, but your godly position, your reputation, your comfort, living and knowing the glory of eternity and saying, I'm going to set this aside. I'm going to take this off. I'm not going to convince anybody with how impressive I look. Next, he doesn't just surrender, but he serves. He gives up his place in heaven not just to come and set up a place on earth. He gives up his place in heaven to serve. And the kind of people that Jesus served, nobody else wanted to serve. In fact, they were so convinced that Jesus shouldn't be serving these people that he's asked the question, do you know who this person is? Do you know who this woman is? Do you know who this, whose house you're going to? Do you know, because if you knew, there's no way we, you would step into their house. And Jesus would respond with statements like, it's not the healthy who need the doctor, but the sick. I have come not to be served, but to serve. The men he called to follow him, the 12 disciples, those apostles that we see represented in in stone and in oil around our world as men of honor were not men of honor when he called them. They were regular guys. Some of them were worse than regular guys. They were betrayers of their own people. They were the unhinged ones. Hey, come follow me. I'm choosing you to be one of my 12. They were betrayers. But those were those that he came to serve. So if you feel yourself unworthy of Jesus' love, unworthy of him serving you, Hear me, he loves you. You are the one he would choose to follow you. Not the impressive, not the influential, not the ones that seem to be making a difference. He would have called you and he would have called me to follow him. Jesus ate with them, spent time with them, gave his life to them. I've heard people say, it's easy to die for something. You just have one moment of sacrifice. But it's hard to live for something. Because it's a day-by-day sacrifice. It's a day-by-day serving. And that's what Jesus did. He served those around him. Even his mom, when the time wasn't right, he served her at the wedding You may have heard the story of the water into wine. Mary's talking to Jesus and saying, hey, they're out of wine. Help them out. Like, do something. She knew that Jesus could do miracles. I don't know if around the house he, like, did little miracles for her. I doubt he snapped his fingers when he did a miracle. But who knows? Usually, almost every time, it was accompanied with prayer to his heavenly father. So she knew he could do miracles, and he says to her, woman, it is not my time. Boys, I'm just telling you, don't say that to your mom. Don't call her woman, okay? Woman, 
But Jesus was like, this is not my time. Don't you make me do this yet. And yet, he serves her. And, and she's like setting it up. Um, go get water and bring it to him and tell him, do whatever he tells you to do with it. Moms, have you ever done that? Uh, or have you ever had a mom do that for you? Set up something behind your back that you're like, oh, now I got to do this thing. That's what happened. And Jesus submitted himself and served the one woman on the face of the earth who knew he was God, who had no way to deny that she was face to face with the creator of the universe, still bossed him around and he still served her. He is a servant by nature, the very form, the very nature of a servant. We don't have to convince Jesus in our prayers to serve us, though we don't deserve it. We are those that people could say, do you know who that is? Do you know how they've messed up? Do you know their life before Christ? Yeah. I've known them from the foundations of the world. When I was bringing creation into existence, I knew their name. Of course I know who I'm spending time with. Of course I know who I'm serving. Jesus wants to serve you today. Let him. Don't try to do his job for him. And then he didn't just surrender. He didn't just serve, but he died. Becoming obedient to death is what the passage says. He served death. The very life of the universe, the very echoes of creation, served the end of creation, death. This is another one of those mind blowers for me. How does the very source of life become subservient to death? And why in the world would he lower himself that low? What is more opposite of life than death? Nothing. But he did that because he loves you. He did that because he said, I will pay any Price. I will serve any master for a season so these people can be free. You know, today we celebrate freedom, 4th of July, and I'm so thankful for our nation, and our nation is also a mess. Both of those things can be true at the same time, and I pray for our country to know Christ as their king. And I'm so thankful for the freedom that we have. You know, there are so many freedoms we have, even as imperfect as our nation is. It is an incredible place that we can be able to do this and not worry that the government's going to shut us down, at least in this season. But the freedom that Jesus offers, freedom from death, freedom from hell, freedom from the grave, freedom from sin, freedom from addiction, freedom from guilt, freedom from fear, freedom from having to make your way in the world, freedom from lack of purpose and false identities, freedom to be who you truly are. Loved, known, chosen, accepted. That's why he served death. That's why he humbled himself to death, even death on the cross, the most humiliating, ugly death known to the world at that time. And if we ended there, what an amazing truth. But that's not the end of this passage. That's not where the story ends for you, and that's not where the story ends for Jesus. The next thing is that Jesus, the glorified king. Jesus isn't just the humble servant. He isn't just the, well, okay, whatever you want. He is a humble servant, but he is also then the glorified king. His lowliness brought even a higher exalting of his position. Have you ever had someone at work get a promotion before you? You're like, uh. I don't think so. That didn't seem fair. That, if they really knew how much this person takes credit for other people's work. <sighs> well, Jesus' promotion was well earned. It was not that in the least. It was not at all this guy who kind of 
just got nice next to the boss and, you know, bought him enough drinks and went golfing with him enough to earn a promotion. Jesus earned it the hard way. Jesus earned it the harder way than anyone else, but he had already deserved it before he did all the hard work, but then he is glorified. He is lifted above all. Philippians 2, 9 through 11 tells it like this. Therefore, God exalted him to the highest place and gave him a name above every name that at the name of Jesus every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth. And every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So the first part here is that Jesus is over all. There's this general power of Christ. In that relationship of the God, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, Jesus was the servant. But all of a sudden at this point, God the Father says, you know what? I'm going to exalt you. I'm going to serve you. I'm going to set you as the focus of us, of me, of the one and the many of who we are. I'm going to rotate this thing. That you are exalted above all else. Therefore, God has exalted him to the highest place. Gave him a name that is above every name. So this very general, he's over the universe, he's over everything. He is the king of kings and the lord of lords. That's what I love about, I mean, there's a lot of things I love about Jesus. But he doesn't have to go to anybody to get permission. He's not like, ah, hold on for a sec, let me check with the manager. You know those people that go and talk to the manager don't actually talk to the manager. So I'm pretending I'm talking to you, and I'll go back out there and tell them, uh, nope. Okay, great. Okay, nope, sorry, uh, there's nothing we can do for you. No, Jesus doesn't have to do that. He can solve your problem today. He can move the way that you need him to move today with nothing hindering him, with no line of authority that he has to go up and down through. He is above all things. He is at the highest place. The next then is that Jesus is honored by all. So we go from this very general thing and start making it a little more personal, just a little more human. It talks in this passage about every knee bowing and every tongue confessing. You know, there's some things in life that I think we can all agree on. In this, you know, a fractured world with so many opinions, there's some that like, Come on, you can't argue with that. The first one is that babies in glasses are cute. You cannot deny that that is a cute baby. Another one is pizza. I mean, who can argue with pizza? I will eat pizza every day for the rest of my life, which would maybe shorten my life, but I would be happy going out eating pizza. Another thing that, you know, I think we can all agree is true is that when winter comes or the fall and you got to pull out your coat and you find a 20 in the pocket, that's an awesome thing. Doesn't it just feel like, I'm rich. A miracle of provision has happened for me. Oh, one year I actually hid one there, but I thought about it all summer. I couldn't trick myself. So it's got to be that surprise. Another one is that astronauts are awesome. They are. They're just astronauts are awesome. And the last one is the least deniable of all possible things. The Packers are the greatest team to ever touch the pigskin. Okay, maybe not that one. But there are certain things you just can't deny. Jesus is the ultimate thing. At the end of the age, nobody can deny that he is king. We will bow to him and serve him as king. Every human who has ever lived In fact, this even says under the earth, talking about demons, every creature that has ever existed will bow to Jesus. We'll agree when they see him glorified, he is the king. And we have a choice to choose to bow to the king now, to willfully bow our knee and say, I worship you, I honor you, king of kings. Be my leader, be my Lord. Or we can say, I don't have to bow to anybody. I make my own way. Nobody can tell me what to do. And we can live our life that way. 
And then at some point in the future, we will see Christ for who he is. And our only possible reaction to seeing him, who he is in his glory, will to be to fall to our knees or probably to our face and declare him as Lord. The problem is, if we don't choose him as Lord, he never will truly be able to be our Lord. Because not only is he king of kings, he also honors our choices and will not impose himself on us and says, if you didn't choose me, even now that you see I'm worthy of honor, you have chosen to reject me and I will not force you to be in my presence. People have said, how can a good God send people to hell? God doesn't send people to hell. In fact, hell was never created for humanity. But it's the only place in the universe that God, God's glory doesn't exist. And so if you don't choose to surrender to his glory, he says, okay, I will not force you to endure my glory for all eternity. And that's a very complex topic, and that was a very short answer, so it is not a perfect answer to that question. But he is the king over all. And making it even more personal is he Lord. So he is the king of kings and the Lord of lords. All people are going to agree on that at some point, but is he Lord of your life? Is he leader of your life? Is he king for you today? That's your choice that you get to make. Why God trusted us to make that kind of choice, I don't know. I wouldn't have trusted me with that kind of choice, but he loves us enough to say, will you make me your Lord? I will not impose it upon you. I will give you a chance to choose and every tongue acknowledge that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. He wants to be your Lord. He's given his all to serve you and just says, do you want in on this? Do you want to be a part of the family? Do you want to come in to relationship with me now and experience the kingdom of God now? And he gives you that choice. The Bible says all we have to do is believe in our heart that God raised Jesus from the dead, that that death on the cross wasn't the end of his life, but was just a transitory state that he was moving through to defeat death in the long run and defeat hell. Do I believe that God raised Jesus from the dead, and will I use my mouth to declare that Jesus is Lord of my life? Before I wrap it up with the third point, I want to give an opportunity for each of us to declare Jesus as Lord. If you already have, then just do it again with me. But for you, this may be the first time. Or maybe you walked away for a while, and Jesus hasn't been your Lord, but you're saying, I, I, want, I want to, on this side, declare that Jesus is Lord. I need the Lord to serve me in my life, though I don't deserve it. I, I want all that God has for me in Christ. So I'm going to just pray a simple prayer. But at one point, I'm going to say, Jesus is Lord. And then right after that, I'll say, Jesus is Lord again. So the second time, you just join in with me and just declare, Jesus is Lord. Heavenly Father, we thank you for the sacrifice of Jesus. And Jesus, we exalt you above all else. I believe that you were raised from the dead. I believe you died for my sins, and I give you all my sin, all my failing, all my imperfection. I lay it all at your feet, Lord Jesus. Take it. Do whatever you want with it, but remove it from me, I pray. And I ask that you would lead me the rest of my life because I believe Jesus is Lord. Jesus is Lord. Let's say it. Jesus is Lord to the glory of God the Father. So we thank you for this, Lord. We give you our lives afresh or for the first time right now. Thank you for serving us. Thank you for being our Lord. Amen. Amen. Well, we have one little point here to hit because there's a response we have to the fact that Jesus is servant and Jesus is Lord. There's a return we have back to him. First of all is to make him your king, which 
We just did through that prayer, 1 Peter 3.15 says it like this, but in your hearts, revere Christ as Lord. So it isn't just that word that we spoke, it's a heart move. Always be prepared to give an answer to everyone who asks you, to give a reason for the hope you have, but do this with gentleness and respect. So in our hearts, let's revere Christ as Lord, but don't let it stop with you. The whole beginning of this passage was Philippians 2.5. In your relationships with one another, have the same mindset as Christ Jesus, who being in the very nature of God, did not consider equality with God as something to be grasped, but gave up his life as a servant for all. So our response after receiving Christ as Lord is to share that good news with other people. It isn't a limited resource. Jesus doesn't run out after a while. Oh, I'm running short on Jesus. Next week, I get more Jesus. Then I can share him with you. No, you always have all of him all the time. Ask the Holy Spirit to fill you up. Ask daily for opportunities to share Christ with people. That isn't my job. You don't pay me to share Christ with people. I mean, it's part of my job, but you don't pay me so you don't have to do it. You pay me to help equip you to do it. That's what the role of a pastor is, is to equip the saints for the work of the ministry. That's why I shared what I shared today, so you know more of who Jesus is and you can share it with people. Not just walk out of here feeling like, man, Jesus loves me. Yes, I hope you feel that. But I hope you say, oh, he loves everybody. They're an image bearer of Christ, and they're an image bearer of Christ, and they don't know Jesus yet, and they need to know him more. And this person, I could share a little more of this one I know, this friend I have, this person who's the king of the universe, but I get to talk to any moment of my life. You don't have to make an appointment with Jesus. He's as close as his name being mentioned on your lips. He's even closer than that. He dwells in us through his Holy Spirit. It's crazy. It's just crazy to me. It's unbelievable that this is true, except I have found it to be true day after day after day after day after day. And I've known too many people whose lives have been transformed like my grandfather for living for himself in his own ways to living for Christ, from living as a broken, crushed, infected man to a man living with a purpose for his king. And every day, his goal was, what can I do for Jesus? Jesus, what do you have for me today? Let that be our heart's desire. What do you got for me today, King? What's on the agenda? What we doing? What's my assignment? Where are we headed? How do you want to serve me today? That's the Jesus that we proclaim. That's the Jesus that we serve. The servant. Jesus is our example. Jesus is our servant. And Jesus is our king. So as I close today, which one of those three pieces do you need most in your life? Do you need Jesus as the example, that you would live this out more? Do you need Jesus as a servant? You're facing something you cannot overcome on your own. And you need him to show up and serve you through this. Or Jesus is king. Maybe you've allowed other things to take higher priority. Maybe you've served other agendas, other pleasures, other mindsets. And you need Jesus to take up that rightful place as king. Which one do you need him to be today? Example, servant, or king? And as I pray for this, just open your heart. Just reach out to the Lord and receive what he's going to give you today. Because he's got something that he's been storing up, waiting for today to give you. Heavenly Father, thank you for Jesus. And Lord Jesus, we come to you, though we are unworthy to even speak your name. We come because you gave it all so we could, so we can have access to you, so we can talk with you. And I ask that you will move right now through the power of your spirit for those that need you to be the example They know you've had a call on their life. They know there's people that they're to share you with, but it just hasn't happened. There's been limitations or fear or or just a selfishness that we don't want to because they're those kind of people. 
Lord, help those of us that need you to be our example, that we can do what you've called us to do. Lord, for those that need you to be their servant, that are in a place where they just have no way out, serve them, Lord. Rescue them. Come below them and lift them up that no one is too far from Christ. Meet them in their point of need, their point of pain, and heal them. Provide for them. Rescue them. Serve them, Jesus. And for those that need you to be king, other things have crept in and taken lordship, taken kingship, have ruled them in their life. We pray today you will set up your throne in their heart and everything else, the good, the bad, the in-between, would have to bow at the feet of Jesus. And nothing else could rule their life other than you. We love you, Jesus. We are so thankful for you. In your name we pray. Amen. Amen. Thank you, Pastor Nathan. And as the worship team comes up, and as those who are going to be helping with the offering today, you can make your way forward as well. Um, a couple of things I just want to point out. If, during the message today, when Pastor Nathan brought up those different times to just surrender your life to Christ or maybe even recommit yourself. If you prayed that prayer, if you really meant that, I, I encourage you to pull out your connection card right now as those who are helping with the offering come on forward. About halfway down, it says, Today I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Or maybe you recommitted your life to him. Check that box, put some contact information on it, drop it in the offering bags and as they go past. And also, if you're looking to give to, to Highland Church financially today, you can just fill out this envelope, drop it in the offering bag, or you could head to highlandag.org. So as the offering bags go past here, if you want to join with us in worship this morning. Just remain seated till I invite you to stand. Please let the ushers finish. Let's sing it together. We are. We are a chosen generation. Rise up, holy nation. God, we live for you. Let's all stand as we close this morning. You have called us out of darkness into light so 